Hello, so today's class is the second feature speaker talk by Dan Cranston, and he'll be speaking about some vertex partitions into an independent set and a forest is each component set. Right. So, uh, yeah, so this is kind of, um, it's, it's the second part uh, about, uh, about the potential method, which is kind of what we talked about last time, and this problem is actually uh, very related to what we talked about last time. Um, so last time we were talking about nearby partite graphs, which is partitioning the vertex set of a graph into these sets that it induce uh, an independent set and a forest. Um, and so today it's kind of the same thing, except that we care about the order of the components uh, in the forest. So each component, each tree in the forest has to have small order. Um, again, this is uh, joint with Matt Yancey, um, and I'm going to, I'm not going to talk as much about, um, uh, I'm not going to talk as much about the overview of the potential method today since we did it last time, um, but I'll kind of try to uh, hint at that some someplace so along the way, and uh, if I don't say anything about the gap lemma, um, know that the gap lemma is kind of the heart of the reducibility arguments again. Um, and I'll try to say a little bit about it maybe at the end. Uh, okay, so let's... Uh, so we talked some about max average degree. So this is kind of a, a slide just reminding you about max average degree. Um, but there are some nice examples. So uh, mad being less than one just means you don't have any edges. And so there's your graph. Um, MAD being less than two means you don't have any cycles, which means you're a forest. Um, so there's your graph. So an interesting thing about MAD less than one is when it's less than one, it means that it's zero. Uh, you can't have any edges at all. But when it's less than two, you can actually get arbitrarily close to two from below. Um, so if you just take a really big tree, the, uh, the average degree is going to two from below. Um, uh, when you jump up to mat, uh, max average degree four, um, it's no longer an if and only if, but a nice class of graphs to think about here is planar bipartite graphs. Um, and so, uh, so here's an example. Um, and one thing I want to point out is that this uh, less than, this strictly less than, can get arbitrarily close to holding with equality, right? So if you think about this grid, um, it's four regular except on the outside, right? On the boundary, it's a little bit less than four because it's planar and so you can't wrap the edges around. But um, if you're thinking about what's the average degree, sort of the quick way to do the calculation is just say the stuff in the middle all has degree four. And then the stuff on the outside is just sort of noise, right? It's sort of a lower order term. Um, this is the number of vertices on the boundary is roughly the square root of the number of vertices. And so with sort of baby analysis, that, that fraction is going to zero. Um, and then you can uh, do a similar thing for planar graphs have max average degree less than six. Um, and you can also get arbitrarily close here to equality. Um, and what you do is you just take a big six regular grid and the argument is the same thing. Uh, everybody in the middle has degree six, and then the, the fraction on the outside is going to zero. Um, and actually, this is all just a special case of something more general. Um, you can make the faces in your grid be length G for any G. Um, and that shows, uh, that's sort of illustrating the sharpness here in this mat of G less than 2G over G minus 2. I think I mentioned this last time. If you haven't seen this before, it's a nice exercise. Uh, it's just sort of an easy consequence of Euler's formula, but it takes you know four lines of algebra or something. Um, so it's maybe a useful thing to work through if you're not familiar with that. Uh, all right, so, so today we're gonna talk about coloring and we're gonna talk about it in a slightly different way. So K coloring, which you're familiar with because you've learned about it in this class, if not before, um, is, oops, not yet. Uh, we're partitioning the vertex set into independent sets. 
Um, but I'm going to phrase it in a sort of a funny way, which is uh, you're partitioning it into sets where each one induces a subgraph of max average degree less than one. And we said on the previous slide, mad less than one just means you don't have any edges. Um, but the reason that we phrase it this way is because now you can sort of, it's easy to see generalizations, right? So what if I give you a graph with chromatic number uh, larger than K, but I only give you K colors to color it with? Um, so uh, here is our good friend, the Peterson graph. Um, and the Peterson graph has chromatic number three, uh, but what if I only give you two colors to color it with? Well, you know, sort of by definition, you can't get all the color classes to be independent sets. Uh, but maybe you can sort of, you can get something that's sort of still in that direction, right? And that's why we rephrase this K coloring this way is then it makes it more obvious uh, one natural way to generalize independent sets is to say, well, we can't get them to all be independent sets, but maybe we can bound the max average degree of each uh, subgraph induced by a color class. So uh, what if instead we change it to say max average degree is less than Ri? So if you look at this coloring, uh, so I've got two color classes, one, the white vertices induce an independent set. Uh, the black vertices uh, induce a matching, right? And this is one special case that you can think about in this framework. So um, if you think about a path on three vertices, two edges, three vertices, the average degree of that is four thirds um, because it's twice the number of edges divided by the vertices. So uh, if you want to forbid a path on three vertices, then what you can do is you can just require that the max average degree be strictly less than four thirds, okay? And so then you can't ever have any, any subgraph that's a path on uh, three vertices. So that means that you just have a matching, right? Each component is order either one or two. Um, so if I say, okay, I wanna two color the graph and one color class is gonna be mad less than one, which means it's an independent set. And then the other color class is gonna be mad less than four thirds, which means you're allowed to have components that are edges, but nothing bigger. That's sort of a one way you could generalize when you don't have enough colors. Uh, so Henry Norrin Wood uh, asked this more general question. Basically what you're trying to do is you're trying to partition this vertex set G into these parts A and B where the subgraph induced by each of the, the parts in the partition has bounded max average degree, right? So uh, the mad of the subgraph induced by big A is strictly less than little a, and the mad in, of the subgraph induced by big B is strictly less than little b. Uh, and what they're asking is, um, what is the weakest hypothesis that you could have on the max average degree of the original graph to be able to, to always guarantee that you can ensure one of these partitions into A and B, okay? Um, so just to sort of put this in context here, uh, you know, this is an example where we're looking for mad of big A is less than one and mad of big B is less than four thirds. Uh, and this graph here is three regular, which means its max average degree uh, is three. Uh, so they were particularly interested in the case where one of the color classes, say the white one, is an independent set. And so that's where you're forbidding edges in that one. Okay? And they're asking sort of, what's the biggest max average degree you could allow uh, so that you can still get one of, these, uh, one of these colorings or one of these partitions? Now, rather than talking about, uh, rather than talking about max average degree, uh, it's sort of, in some sense, I think it's uh, easier visually uh, in the case when B is less than two. So if A is, little a is one, uh, which means it's an independent set, and little b is less than two, then what that means is that the, the subgraph induced by the black vertices is going to be a forest. Um, and if you just do this little calculation, you can translate between whatever B you choose that's less than, than two and 
the order bound that you want on the components in the forest. So uh, when you translate this way, I think it's sort of easier to stare at and say, okay, well, that, uh, that tree has you know, five vertices. Uh, that's maybe easier to see than immediately what the max average degree is. So this is sort of what we do is we translate the problem into an IFK coloring. Uh, so it's a partition into these uh, parts, I and FK, where I is an independent set, and FK induces a forest where each tree has at most K vertices, okay? So this problem here of searching for an IFK coloring uh, is just equivalent to the problem of searching for G1B uh, or searching for mad of G is less than one and mad of GB is less than some value that you specify here that's uh, at most two. Okay. So for today's talk, I'm gonna focus on this IFK coloring, but it's sort of an equivalent formulation. All right, so let me tell you what we proved. Uh, again, I think I mentioned this, this uh, the results I'll talk about today are joint with Matt Yancey. Um, okay, so we have some threshold uh, F of K. And at a first glance, what this is, is it's roughly three minus three over K, right? As K gets big, this is three over three K minus one and three over three K minus two. So it's roughly three minus one over K. So big level, it's something a little bit less than three. And uh, what we're saying is, if your max average degree is bounded above by this threshold, then you have an IFK coloring. So then you can partition into an independent set and a forest where each tree has order at most little k. Um, so let's just look at an example here. So this graph here, uh, I believe the, uh, the average degree is something like uh, three minus a fifth. Um, so you can work it out. That's the average degree and that's the max average degree. Uh, so if you rephrase that over here, if you say three minus one fifth, then that would also be three minus three over 15, right? And so then you wanna look at, so if you plug in K equals five, then three, you get three minus three over 13, um, which is too tight of an upper bound. Uh, your graph doesn't satisfy that. But if you plug in K equals six, then you get three minus three over 17, which is, uh, an upper bound that's satisfied by this graph. Uh, so what the theorem says is that you do have an I F6 coloring, right? So here you've got this tree that's of order six um, and uh, the white vertices uh, are an independent set. You know, get, you've got a couple of trees of order two up here. Um, so uh, what the theorem is saying is for this graph, it's saying you do have an I F6 uh, coloring, you might not have an IF5 coloring. And if you play around with this for a little bit, you can convince yourself that you really don't have an IF5 coloring just by the symmetry of the graph. There's not much you can do better than this. Um, so, uh, so the result is when you have this bound on max average degree, then you're guaranteed one of these colorings. And the sharpness example is saying you can't do any better. So we get, um, what we get is an, uh, an infinite family of graphs that tends to this value for every K, an infinite family of graphs that tends to this max average degree from above. Um, and none of the graphs in that family have the IFK coloring, okay? So let's see, let's, let's just look at a concrete corollary. So if G is planar, and it's got girth at least say nine, then G has a partition into an independent set and a forest with each component of order at most three. Um, and how does the proof go? Uh, well, the proof is if you want to partition into components of order at most three, you plug in, uh, what do you plug in here? You plug in three, right? That's the order of the tree that you want. So you do three minus three over three, divided uh, three minus three over seven, which turns out to be 18 sevenths. So this says, if your max average degree is at most 18 sevenths, then you can get this partition, this IF3 partition or IF3 coloring. 
And then what about how do we know that planar graphs with girth at least nine have this bound on their max average degree? Uh, it goes back to that first slide that I showed you. This is 2g over g minus 2 when you plug in g equals 9, right? So you get 18 over 9 minus 2, which is 7. Um, so uh, in a sense, what that's saying is uh, you're not, for that, you're really not using the planarity of the graph per se. You're just sort of using the sparseness of the graph uh, that is implied by the planarity and the girth. Um, and then you can do a similar thing for f, uh, for if you have uh, girth at least eight, then the max average degree bound is a little bit weaker. So your max average degree could be a little higher. Uh, and so you need to allow trees of uh, order at most four. And similarly, if you drop to girth seven, then you need to allow trees of order at most six. Okay. Um, one other comment about this. Uh, the sharpness example is it doesn't actually uh, make use of the fact that we're requiring the uh, the subgraph induced by FK to be acyclic. So even if you drop the requirement that it's acyclic, but you just require that each component in that subgraph induced by FK has at most K vertices, then the same sharpness examples will work. So it's, uh, it's kind of robust in that sense. Um, so before I go on, does, do the, does the results make sense? Um, are there any questions about this? Yeah, cool. Okay, so let me tell you a little bit of uh, background. So this is a fairly recent result um, of, I believe it's two PhD students in Poland. Um, that's, this is on the archive now. I don't know if it's uh, appeared yet. But uh, what they show is, so there's, you're starting with a graph G and what you want to do is you wanna delete some independent set I and you wanna have the max average degree drop by as much as you can, right? So you want, um, you wanna pick your independent set so that after you delete it, the max average degree drops by a lot. Um, and they prove that you can always pick an independent set so the max average degree drops by at least one. And this, this thing about having an edge is sort of silly because if you don't have an edge, then your max average degree is zero and you can't drop it by anything because you're already at zero. Um, so here's our running example again. So you can think about this graph, the max average degree of the Peterson graph is three because it's three regular. Um, and if you delete this independent set in white, then the max average degree drops. So the max average degree of the black subgraph is now one. So this is sort of a very easy graph to do this for because by de deleting an independent set, you can drop mad by two from three all the way down to one um, rather than just by the one that's guaranteed from their, their result. Um, and then similarly, they showed if you want to delete a forest rather than just an independent set, you can drop the max average degree by two. Um, and so here you can think of rather than deleting the white vertices, think of deleting the black vertices. Um, and so now your max average degree was three. And after you delete it, your max average degree is zero for the subgraph induced by the white vertices. So again, fairly easy. And this uh, hypothesis about having a cycle is sort of silly because if you don't have any cycle, then your mat is less than two. Um, so, I mean, it's necessary to be precise, but it's, it's sort of a, a necessary uh, hypothesis. Um, and so this is just rephrasing their results in the language of the question asked by Henry Norn and Wood. Um, so Borden, Kostotka, and Yancey. Uh, oh, so I'll mention briefly, this is uh, last time I was talking about uh, for finding these sets of low potential um, algorithmically, I said Max Floman cut is a good thing. So, uh, so this proof here is also using Max Floman cut. So if you're not familiar with that, that's a good um, tool you should have in your tool bag. And you should go and uh, read about Max Floman cut and think about all the ways that you can use that. But uh, okay, so Borden, Kostochka, Yancey, they proved G four thirds, four thirds equals 14 fifths. So what does this mean? 
So the thing to remember about four thirds is that four thirds is the average degree of a path on two edges. It's a path on three vertices. So what this notation means is if we're going to forbid, so in color class white, we're going to forbid max average degree being equal to four thirds. So we want it to be strictly less than four thirds, which means you forbid a path on two edges. So what this is saying is in the, the white color class, you want it to be a matching. It can, each component is either an isolated vertex or it's an edge. Um, and then it's the same thing for the black color class as well. And so what this notation says is, if your max average degree is strictly less than 14 fifths, then you can get this coloring where each of the two color classes induces a matching. Um, and a little bit earlier, Bord and, and Kostochka did G of one four thirds. And so what does this mean? So remember one is just, that's the average degree of an edge. And so if you have mad strictly less than one, then that means you don't allow any edges. So this is saying you want color class uh, white to induce an independent set and you want color class black to induce a matching. And if the max average degree of your graph is less than 12 fifths, then you can do it. Um, and in fact, this, um, this result here is just k equals two in our main theorem, right? So you're saying I want an independent set in one color class and I want the trees in my forest to be order at most two. Um, and uh, in some sense, our approach uh, builds on and generalizes what they did here. Uh, there were a number of other results that I won't go into in great detail. In each of these cases, uh, they're looking for um, they're looking for this partition, and they they have uh, stronger hypotheses and weaker conclusions than what we'll talk about today. So these are all sort of subsumed by the result that I'll present today. Okay, so. Uh, we want to talk about uh, sharpness examples. And I, I said that max average degree threshold is sharp. Um, what we're going to do is uh, construct an infinite family for each K, construct an infinite family where the max average degree is approaching uh, that threshold from above and show that each uh, graph in this uh, family does not have an IFK coloring, right? Um, so you can't increase that threshold at all, or it, the result would be false. So we introduced this not notion of uh, IFK critical graphs. And what this means is um, you don't have an IFK coloring, but if you delete any edge, then you do have an IFK coloring or IFK partition. Uh, so what I want to show you is that these graphs here that I've drawn and you can sort of guess, I'll explain this whole thing. It looks a little scary, but um, it's not really that scary. Um, what I wanna show you is that this family of graphs, none of them have an IFK coloring and they have max average degree approaching, uh, approaching this value from above. So the first thing to talk about is how do you read this graph? So when you see something in green, everything in green on the picture is a multiplicity. So uh, here, for example, I've got this, we call this a two thread. So it's a path on three edges and these internal vertices of the path are degree two. So that's a two thread. Um, and this K over two here is saying that you've got a bunch of parallel two threads. So they have this vertex in common at the end and this vertex in common at the end, but each of these threads has their own uh, two vertices of degree two in the middle. And how many of them are there? There's K over two floor of them, okay? And then there's K minus one over two floor here and there's K minus two over two floor here. Uh, so that's multiplicities on the two threads. And then the same thing is on these triangles. So, what these are pendant triangles. And what we've got is we've got K over two of them that are all uh, pendant at this vertex. So they all share this vertex here in common and they each have two degree two vertices of their own, okay? So let me give names to a few things. Uh, we'll call this vertex here V zero 
or V naught, uh, W naught, and X naught, and then V1, W1, X1, V2, W2, X2, and so on. Um, and then we won't name these uh, degree two vertices. So the idea of the proof is that we'll start at the left end and suppose that we have an IFK coloring or IFK partition, and then we'll sort of force what it has to look like as we move from the left end down to the right end. And then at the right end, everything's going to work until almost at the very end, and then it's going to break. Um, so the thing to observe about one of these triangles is that in a triangle, at most, one vertex can be colored I. Uh, the other two vertices are going to have to be colored F. So what that means is if this vertex here is colored F, then it's going to get an F neighbor, a neighbor that's colored F, in at least in, uh, in each of these triangles. So if he's colored F, then he'll be colored F and he'll have K over two floor F neighbors, okay? So suppose for a minute uh, that this vertex here down at the bottom, V naught was colored I, let's just say. Uh, then that would mean that W naught and X naught were both colored F and uh, X naught is going to get K over two floor neighbors that are colored F, and W naught is going to get K minus one over two floor neighbors that are colored F. Now let's look at the order of this F component, right? So you've got uh, one here for X naught, one here for W naught, and then how many more? Well, you can think of K over two floor, you can think of that as K minus one over two ceiling. It's the same thing. And so when you add that to this thing down here, what you end up with is K minus one. So when you add this and this, you've got K minus one, and then you've got one more for W naught and one more for X naught. And so you get K minus one plus two. So you would get an F component that's of order K plus two. Uh, so K plus one, K minus one plus two, it's K plus one. Uh, but that's not allowed, right? So we'll get an F component that has too many vertices. So that's a problem. So what that tells us is we can't have this guy colored I. So V naught is gonna have to be colored F. And then if you repeat the same argument with him and one of his neighbors here, what you're gonna see, so let's just look down here. Um, so if you've got V naught and uh, W naught are both colored F, then when you add up the F neighbors, you get independent triangles. This is K minus two over two uh, floor, and this is K minus two over two ceiling. So together it's K minus two. Then you add one here and you add one here, you end up in an F component of order K. Okay, so the point is any coloring that uh, could possibly work just starting for this triangle, V naught, W naught, X naught, and their pendant triangles. It's going to have to have V naught is going to be colored F, and he's going to be in a component of order K, an F component of order K. And that's actually going to be really helpful for sort of pushing our way down the rest of the graph, because it means that all of these neighbors here are going to have to be colored I. Right, because we've already sort of maxed out the order of our F component. And if we add any more neighbor that's colored F, then the F component would be too big. Um, okay, so you've got, he's colored F and he's in a max size F component just on this left end. So these guys are colored I, all of them, which means all of these guys are colored F. Okay, and now, it's, it maybe looks scary because you think, oh, we, we've just made it a little bit down the, down the path. But in fact, we're just going to repeat the same argument that we did here on the left end at each one of these triangles. Because all of these vertices adjacent to the vertices on the triangle, they're all colored F now because their neighbors are colored I. Um, now we can repeat the same argument with V not, uh, V1, W1, and X1, right? And so that same argument is gonna show you that you can't have V1 colored I because then the F component with W1 and X1 would be too big. Uh, so V1 is colored F and actually it's in an F component of order K. 
And so then that means that these guys are all colored I, so these guys are all colored F. So then V2 is in an F component of order K, and it sort of keeps going all the way down to the end until you get down to V, say, VT. So VT is in an F component of order K, and everything looks great, except you've got this one more triangle here. And this last little triangle is going to break things because this vertex here is colored F. And now at least one of these guys has to be colored F. And so it's going to push the order of that F component up from K to K plus one. Um, so you can't quite finish the, the coloring. And that uh, the idea that you can almost make it, but not quite, sure, sort of should make sense that this is just barely too high of a max average degree, right? Um, OK, so let's actually compute the max average degree of this thing. Well, let me just say that uh, I'll compute the average degree. And it turns out that the max average degree is also the average degree. Um, so how do we compute the, uh, the average degree? So basically, what you want to do is you want to think about when you add one of these chunks in the middle, right? what happens? Sort of how much does it add to the edge count and how much does it add to the vertex count? Okay. So when you, when you add another one of these chunks, you think about this, uh, this construction as having arbitrarily many of these sort of big chunks right in here. Uh, they stretch off to the right. When you add one, how many vertices do you add? Well, for each of these, uh, so for each of these two threads, you're going to add two vertices. And there's how many two threads? There's k over 2 here, k minus 1 over 2 here, and k minus 2 over 2 here, right? Um, and then at the end, you have to add these three new triangle vertices. So it's twice the number of two threads plus three vertices for the triangle. And when you work through the algebra, this comes out to a very simple 3k minus 1 or 3k minus 2. Uh, and the way to sort of see this intuitively is, for a minute, forget about the floors. So if you didn't have these floors in here, this 2 would just cancel with all the 2s in the denominators. And you'd get k plus k minus 1 plus k minus 2. You'd get 3k minus 3. And then you add the 3. And so you end up with just 3k. OK? Now, when k is even, you lose, uh, you, you lose a little bit from this middle floor. Uh, you don't lose anything from the first or last floor. Uh, and that is the minus 1. And when k is odd, you lose a little bit here and a little bit here. Um, and so uh, you get to 3k minus 2. OK, so this is the number of vertices that you add when you add another one of these chunks. And the point is, we're trying to compute what's the average degree of this graph. Um, now, the number of edges that you add, well, you could do sort of the same thing. But here's a slightly shorter way to think about it. Um, for each one of these uh, two threads that you add, before you are adding two vertices, and now you're adding three edges, right? Um, and so what you can do is, for the, uh, for the number of vertices that you, that you added before on the two threads, you just multiply that by three halves. Uh, so what you do is you sort of subtract off the three vertices on the triangle, you multiply everything else by three halves, and then you add back the three edges on the triangle. Okay, so this works out to 3n minus 3 over 2. Uh, that's the number of edges that you add when you add one of these chunks. Um, and so now what we're interested in is what's the, the, the change in the average degree or the average degree of the added stuff. And the average degree of any graph is just twice its number of edges over its number of vertices. So when you work this all out, you come to exactly these thresholds that we saw on the previous slide. So these are the thresholds uh, in, the, uh, in the main theorem. And uh, so I told you sort of, I did this average degree count for each of these chunks. Um, it turns out that the chunk at the left end, it looks a little bit different. But it turns out that the average degree is exactly the same as one of the chunks in the middle. So the only place where you're off a little bit is with this pendant triangle at the end. Okay, And the way to think about the pendant triangle is, you add two vertices and you add three edges, OK? And so what you do is you sort of take the weighted average of what you had before and three. And, you, and so you're pushing the average degree a little bit towards three. 
right? And so what that means is we knew what the average degree for this whole thing was without the pendant triangle. We add the pendant triangle. Um, before it was this, and when you add the pendant triangle, it goes just a little bit above that, right? And so this is sort of, it has just, just a smidge too much average degree. And so it works out that you can't do it. Um, so I said that these things are critical. I showed that you can't color them. Uh, the argument that you can color them whenever you delete an edge is a little bit tedious, but basically the thing to think about is this argument of showing that the IFK coloring had to look the way it did, it was very sharp. Like there was, there was no slack in it at all. And if at any point you're missing an edge, then you can sort of wiggle away from the, the coloring that I was prescribing. And you can get I down here on some vertex. And once you get I there, you can keep I down here all the way to the end. And then you can finish this bit with two, two vertices colored F. Okay. So uh, before I go on, does the, does the sharpness examples make sense? Are there, are there questions about that? I've got a question. Yeah, go ahead. Um, so when you were coloring it, you said, so starting from the left, you said the first, the leftmost vertices in the two thread had to all be I? Right. So but that so, vertex, but the, the three, those had to all be I, right? These all have to be I, yes. So the so, reason is because this guy, we said he has to be colored F. And if you just look at the uh, V naught, W naught, X naught, and their uh, pendant triangles, the, just from that stuff alone, the order of the, the F component containing V naught is going to be order K. Okay. And so you sort of used up all of the F slack. Um, in the component containing him. And so that's what forces all these guys to be colored I. So I think I'm a little lost on then why all of the next vertices you said all have to be an F. Well, the idea is because I is an independent set, right? Oh yeah, okay. And there's, there, okay. The, it's a little hard to see that the edges are there, right? But yeah, there's edges between each pair. Yeah. Does that make sense? Uh, yeah. Cool. So All right. I have a question on this this weighting yeah. of, of these. Is did you try other weight weightings or like some kind of equal weighting? Um, um I don't know. So so when I was saying the the weighting, I guess what I meant was I was trying to make sort of a mental uh sort of a, a back of the envelope calculation, right? So what I'm trying to say is what we did is uh we played around with a lot of things and we eventually found this family of graphs, right? And we thought that this family of graphs was, uh, we, we sh saw from this argument that you can't actually IFK color this family of graphs. And then what I was trying to argue when I was mentioning this idea of weighting was just sort of an intuitive argument about how you can think about the average degree of these graphs, right? So what I mean by that is, um, when you, so in general, um, if you, uh, if you have, if you have the average degree of some graph and then you add a little bit to it and you compute the average degree, sort of the twice number of edges over vertices that you added, then the average degree of the whole thing is going to be somewhere in between those two numbers, right? What you started with and what you added to it, it's sort, of, it's sort of pulling it. You can think of it as a weighted average. If you actually write out the algebra for the average degree of the whole thing, it turns out that it's just a weighted average where the weights on the things come from the orders of the, the stuff that you started with and the stuff that you added. So it's just sort of a quick way to think about, okay, this stuff has average degree this, and this little bit you added two vertices and three edges. So that sort of the change is towards three. Um, me, and so thinking of it as a weighted average is just one way to phrase that. Yeah, let me clarify my, I, okay. my question. I meant like the, the weighting on the, the number of parallel edges you have. Ah, 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 these uh, multiplicities, yes. Um, yeah, I mean, so I guess what I would say is the thing about constructing sharpness examples is uh, you always 
just play around with stuff and you sort of start to develop some intuition about what you think might work. Um, what happened, as is typically the case, is uh, you, you start with like the case k equal three or the case k equal four and you work out something there and then you try to figure out what might generalize. So it turns out that uh, these graphs uh, do generalize the case k equals two from the kostochka yancey paper. But if you think about it for a second, the case k equal two is kind of hard to see in this picture because when k equals two, k minus two over two and k minus one over two are both zero, right? So these paths just completely vanish. So in retrospect, you can look at it and you can be like, oh, this is generalizing their sharpness example. But when I looked at their sharpness example, I never would have thought, oh, this is the way to generalize it because there's just paths here that aren't there in their example because their multiplicity is zero. So um, we just kind of played around with it. I guess the point is if you find something that you think is sharp and then once we actually prove the result, well, then there's no reason to kind of try other weightings, right? Because now from our result, we know that it's sharp. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay, cool. Uh, let's, so, okay, so now what I wanna tell you is a little bit about uh, how we prove this. Um, so for, uh, for the sake of this slide, I'm just gonna focus on the case K equals four. Um, and uh, now because of the context of this, you should not be surprised to see this row function. Right? I told you I'm going to talk about the potential method. There's the row function. Um, so this is sort of like what we talked about last time. Um, you've got some multiplier on the number of vertices and then some multiplier on the number of edges. So if you think about in the kostochka yancey this was five times vertices minus three times edges. Um, in our result for simple graphs, it was three times the vertices minus two times edges. And then for plain, uh, for simple graphs, so for multigraphs, it was three times vertices and two times edges. For simple graphs, it was eight times vertices minus five times edges. Um, but the thing to think about is that ratio is always coming from what's the average degree in your sharpness example. So if you go and you look at uh, the case k equals four. So let's just go back and look at the case k equals four here. So when k is even, you get three minus three over, this turns out to be 11. So it's 33 minus three over 11. So that's 30 over 11. Uh, so the 30 over 11 shows up as this 15 uh, and 11, right? So this 15 is always sort of half the denominator of the thing, you're, uh, of the numerator and the 11 is the denominator, right? For the average degree that you're looking at. Uh, and so we said, if G is IF4 critical, then row four of V of G is less than or equal to negative three. So again, here's the thing to keep in mind, max average degree being less than or equal to 30 elevenths is uh, equivalent to row being non-negative, right? So what's going on when you add vertices, you add like you get a lot for your row. And then when you add edges, you lose some, right? So as the number of edges goes up per vertex, then row drops. Um, and the way that we've put in these coefficients tell us that we're gonna, we're gonna be getting out a value that's sort of uh, relative to max average degree 30 elevenths. So if it's uh, rho is positive, then it's saying it's strictly less than. If it's negative, then it's saying it's greater than, and so on. Um, so if we could prove this theorem, uh, which I'll sort of say a little bit more about on the rest of the slide, then that would immediately give us the result that we saw on the first slide. So the results for max average degree are gonna follow from this statement about critical graphs, okay? So the intuition is if your mad is less than 30 elevenths, then rho r is greater than or equal to zero for every r. So in particular, you can never have rho 
VG or row R be less than or equal to three. So you can't have any critical subgraph, right? Because if you had a critical subgraph, its row would be less than or equal to negative three, but you know you don't have that from this mad hypothesis, okay? So it's sort of saying, this is saying that the graph is sparse and every subgraph is sparse. And this is saying, if you have a critical subgraph, then it's dense. And so by hypothesis, every subgraph is sparse, so you can't have a dense subgraph, so you can't have a critical subgraph. So that's kind of the intuition between the two. Um, so it turns out that it's sort of easier to, uh, when we're proving this stuff, to talk about these critical graphs. Now, if you go back to the, uh, the end of class last time, um, I talked about these three, um, these three sort of difficulties added difficulties that made our argument much more challenging than the kostochka yancey proof uh, for three coloring. And the three difficulties that I mentioned were that one, the colors were not the same. So in theirs, when you're three coloring, colors one, two, and three are kind of all the same and you could permute them. And our colors I and F from last time were not the same. Um, and that difficulty is still present here. Um, and then there were some other difficulties about uh, let's see, the other difficulties were that uh, we had this, this family of forbidden subgraphs and that was a real nuisance that required a lot of work. Um, and then we also had the case that um, there's, it had been saying their result was something where you said row, um, if uh, then row was, let's see, uh, I'm trying to remember how to say it. So. Basically, uh, in order to get a, uh, a contradiction from the discharging, uh, it, for them, it was just enough to do the discharging. For us, because it's this, uh, this negative three, uh, we needed to do the discharging and then a little bit more. So you needed to find a little bit of extra charge. So um, those two things, the colors being different, that's still an issue. Colors I and colors FK are still gonna be different. Um, and we're still gonna do have to do a little bit of extra work to find, uh, find a coloring at the end if, uh, if we have just as much charge as you would say. We have to sort of find a little bit of extra charge. But we don't have these forbidden subgraphs. And that actually makes our life much nicer. Um, so anyway, um, in order to handle this problem of, uh, the, the two colors being different, uh, colors I and FK being different, we're gonna do just like we mentioned last time, we're gonna generalize this result to pre-coloring. So what you're gonna wanna do, um, when you go by induction, you're gonna wanna sort of say, okay, this vertex has to be colored this way and this vertex has to be colored this way. Um, and that sort of comes out of the gap lemma. Uh, so we generalize to pre-coloring uh, and we're going to actually go a step further. We're not going to just say there's two types of colors. There's colors I and FK. We're going to say there's a bunch of types of colors. Uh, so here you've got these, let's say we have this, verte uh, this path on three vertices. And here's a pre-coloring that you could have. So you might specify that a vertex is colored I. You might specify that a vertex is colored U. But in addition, you're going to specify that it has two neighbors that are colored F. Okay, so that's what the U2 is. And this F2 is saying uh, it's colored F and it's in a component, an F component of order two. So this here, this uh, sort of with these pre colorings, this is just compact notation for saying this. So here, what I mean, this is sort of a, a simpler model of pre-coloring where you're just saying uh, the vertex is either colored I, which is shown as white, or colored F, which is shown as black, or it's not pre-colored, which is shown as gray. Uh, so this I here comes to white. This U2 comes to it's uncolored, but it has two neighbors that are colored F. Um, and then this F2 says it's colored F and it has another neighbor that's colored F, okay? So this is 
just compact notation for this. And this is the uh, sort of the natural pre-coloring that you might come up with when you say, okay, we want to somehow be able to force uh, that we have certain colors on certain vertices. So if we're going to make this statement for these pre-colored vertices, right? The pre-colored vertices over here, where I specify your color I, your color U2, your color F2, etc. cetera. Um, these U, the subscript could go from zero all the way up to, in our case, four. Um, and the subscript on, uh, oh, I guess I, I'll say, I only made it go up to uh, three because somehow when you're colored F4, then you might as well just delete that vertex it um, because you know that all the neighbors have to be colored I. Anyway, um, and the thing to see here, so what we're doing is we're trying to generalize this row function, okay? So you've still got this 15 times u0 sort of corresponds to the guys, uh, sorry, there's no u0 in the picture, but u0 is the guys that don't have any constraints. You can think of those as just like normal unprecolored vertices. And you still have this minus 11 times the number of edges. The thing to think about here is as you put more constraints on the vertex, on the coloring, it's going to contribute less to your potential function, right? Because so, so for example, um, this vertex here that's colored F2, um, it's, uh, it, it's harder to color a graph with a vertex colored F2 than it is to color a graph with that same vertex uncolored, right? Because it's sort of, making your life harder. It's more constraints on your coloring. So the idea is that we want, um, we want to reflect sort of the difficulty of the constraints in this potential function. And don't worry right now about exactly where these coefficients come from. But what I want you to notice is that as you add more constraints, the coefficients decrease, right? So here it's 15 and then 12 and then nine and then six. Here it's eight and then five and then three and then zero, okay? Um, here it's four. Um, but um, so there's sort of this uh, decrease, roughly it's you decrease by three every time you sort of add another F neighbor. Um, and that's true in U and that's sort of almost true in F. You go from eight to five, and then for down to three for some reason instead of two, and then from three down to zero. Um, so uh, I'll tell you more about where those things come from, but the idea is that you want to generalize this thing and you want to do it in a way that reflects how much harder it is to color each of those vertices. Okay, so now what are we going to do? Uh, we need to generalize this theorem here to these pre-colored graphs. And so we need to specify what does it mean to have an IF4 critical pre-colored graph, right? So a pre-colored graph, you can sort of think of it this way or think of it this way, uh, they're equivalent. But it says it's just like the same thing as before. So you don't have an IFK coloring. And if you delete any edge, then you do have an IFK coloring. Uh, but in addition, let me just mention this idea of weakening the pre-coloring. So what I mean by that is, uh, if you were to change the subscript on F2 to, uh, from F2 to F1, say, or if you were to change U2 to U1. So this is any constraint that you have, any pre-colored vertex that you have, if you were to somehow make it a little bit easier to color, then uh, you should be able to color that. So let's look at this example. So it turns out that this, this graph here is an IF4 critical graph, okay? So if you look at it right now, you don't have a lot of choices about how you might try to extend this pre-coloring. There's only one uncolored vertex. So there's not a lot of choice. Uh, you can't color this guy I because then you would break that I is an independent set. And if you color him F, then you get an F component of order one, two, three, four, five but that's not allowed in an IF4 coloring, okay? So this graph here, 
you can think of it in this way, or you can think of it in this sort of expanded version, but they're equivalent. Uh, it doesn't have an IF4 coloring. But if you were to delete any edge, so let's say, for example, we were to delete this edge right here, um, then you could just color this gray vertex uh, black. And you'd be OK, because now you would have one F component of order two and another F component of order three. And that would be fine. Okay, And that's sort of true if you delete any of these edges among the black vertices, black and gray vertices. The other instance is, what if you were to delete this, this edge here? Then you could color this gray vertex white. Okay, um, And that would be an IFK coloring of the smaller graph. Um, so now the thing to think about is, what does that correspond to when I, uh, when I come back here? OK? So if I delete, say, this, this edge here that was in my original graph, that's deleting this edge. OK? So that's just this normal sense of critical. If you delete an edge, then you can now color it. It's the same for this edge, which corresponds to this edge. Uh, on the other hand, I also mentioned this idea of weakening the pre-coloring. So what does that mean? So that would correspond to something like deleting one of these edges. So if I delete this edge here, what I'm doing is I'm changing the pre-coloring on this vertex from F2 to F1, right? So now this vertex is not really there anymore. So he is pre-colored F, but he doesn't have any other F neighbors. So he only contributes one to that F component. And so now he's gone, this vertex here is gone. And so you can color the gray one black, and you'll get a component of order four rather than five, which is allowable. Okay, uh, so you can walk through and sort of look at all the possibilities and see that this graph really is uh, IF4 uh, critical. So now, what does our main theorem say? It says if G is a pre colored graph uh, and G is IF4 critical, then row four of VG is less than or equal to negative three. Um, so this is basically, it's the exact same statement here, except that we've generalized to pre-colored. And when you did that, you have to generalize the notion of R4, row four to pre-colored, and you use this definition. Okay? Uh, this, this real main theorem uh, is true even if you replace four with k for arbitrary integer k at least two. Um, it's the exact same statement. Um, what I haven't told you then is uh, I would have to define what rho k is, right? And I would have to give you the coefficients on all these guys here. And I'm not going to do that because it will not be enlightening. Um, but let's just look uh, to finish our running example on the slide. Let's look at this graph here and compute what's the, what's the rho value for that. Well, so I is going to contribute 4. And U2 is going to contribute 9. And F2 is going to contribute 5. So you get 4 plus 9 plus 5. That's 18 minus 2 times 11 for each of the edges. That ends up 18 minus 22 is negative 4. So this graph right up here is not a counterexample to our theorem, right? Because rho for the graph ends up being negative 4. The, the theorem says it's at most negative three, okay? So it's good when there are no graphs on three vertices that are counterexamples to your theorem. Uh, all right, so what do we still need to do is sort of talk about uh, where do these coefficients come from? Um, and it's, it's really sort of not as bad as you might think. Um, so, the idea is that we're going to sort of use gadgets. Uh, we're going to hang little extra parts off of our graph to force uh, the pre-coloring the way we want. So we said that uh, with a triangle, in every triangle, uh, this vertex here is going to have a neighbor colored F, right? So either he's colored I, and then his neighbors colored F don't really matter or he'll be colored F, and then one of these will be I, but the other one will be F. And so it will add to the order of its F component. And so the idea is 
what you're going to do, you're going to sort of build this pre-coloring up inductively. So you start out with all the vertices in the pre-coloring as being pre-colored U0, which means they're uncolored and they don't have any constraints of any sort. Um, and then what you do is if you want to move it to saying, well, you're uncolored, but you have an F neighbor, uh, you have one F neighbor, or you have seven F neighbors or whatever, for each time that you want to add an F neighbor, you just add a pendant triangle, okay? And then that pendant triangle will, will give you one of these forced neighbors colored F. And this is exactly what we saw at the left end of our sharpness examples. Uh, it's almost the same thing for if you're colored F and you want to increase uh, the number of uh, the order of your F component. So you do the same thing, except there's one case where you don't do the same thing. So that case is here. So if you really want sort of a, a large F component, then rather than just hanging off a whole bunch of these triangles, it's more efficient from this uh, potential standpoint, it's more efficient to hang one of these things off. So you start with V being in U0, and then you hang this whole thing off. And basically, these guys uh, can't both be colored F um, and him be colored I. So he'll have to be colored F. And then he'll get all of the F neighbors from this one or all of the F neighbors from this one. And again, we saw this again at the left end of our sharpness construction, right? This just looks like the left end of the sharpness construction with the pendant triangles that V deleted. Uh, how do you force a vertex to be colored I? Uh, this one's easy. You could just give it a neighbor that's forced to be colored FK, okay? Which sort of seems like, well, we still don't know how to get a vertex colored FK. Um, how do you for, uh, uh, and then how do you force a vertex to be colored F1? You give it a neighbor colored I. So this sort of, this, uh, okay, so, so how would we do this? If we want a vertex to be colored F1, what would we do? Well, we would start out with one of these guys that's forced to be colored FK plus three over two. And then you would add a whole bunch more triangles to force the subscript up to FK, okay? Um, using this down here. And then you've got this vertex colored FK and you add a neighbor and he's forced to be colored I. And then you take that guy and you add another neighbor and this guy will now be forced to be colored uh, F1. So one thing that you, uh, that you notice with this, this uh, pre-coloring, you're sort of adding all these gadgets. Uh, and the, adding the gadgets seems like it's troublesome if you want to do induction. Because typically when you want to do induction, you want to do something like induction on the number of vertices. Or you can say induction, or you can say minimal counterexample. They turn out to be the same thing. Uh, and so this is the point of, if we go back, to here, this is the point of defining this very rich pre-coloring. So if I were to just do this um, and say, oh, I want to pre-color this, and so I'm just going to add some neighbors, then the order of this graph is bigger than the order of my original graph. And so I can't invoke the induction hypothesis. So instead, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to keep it in this language. I'm going to say, I didn't grow the order of my graph at all. I just pre-colored things. Okay, so now if you really unpack this, what it's doing is it's, it's doing this and actually it's doing much worse than this because every place that you see a black vertex, there's gadgets hanging off. And every place that you see a white vertex, there's gadgets hanging off. But I'm just gonna define the order of my pre-colored graph here to be three rather than to be six or to be whatever it is with all the gadgets implemented. So you might say, that sounds like cheating, right? Like how can you just say that, that's, that the order is just smaller than it actually is? Uh, the thing to think about with induction is you can define the order for your induction, for your graphs, any way you like. The only thing that you have to worry about is make sure that you don't have any infinitely descending chain, right? You just have to make sure that when you sort of apply induction, when you do this recursive call with induction, you eventually bottom out. Okay, and so what we're doing is we're using this pre-coloring to define sort of the partial order for our induction, right? So one sort of fancy way to say, 
to uh, that you're doing induction is you have a partial order on the graph, right? And you're um, you're invoking the induction hypothesis on somebody that's smaller in the partial order, and and you need that your partial order doesn't have any infinitely descending chain. So eventually you'll hit the base case in your in your induction, and so this sort of fancy uh, overly rich uh, pre-coloring notation that allows us to say, oh, this graph, it's really just order three. And this graph, when we're talking about it, it's actually with all of these things hanging off and multiple copies of these things hanging off. But we say, just don't really pay attention to them. They don't really count. Um, and so it's sort of, um, so, so you could actually, um, I guess what I want to say is that um, the, the statement for, so if you come back here, the statement for the pre-colored version and the original statement are actually logically equivalent. Because when you're talking about the pre-colored version, what you're actually doing is, you're actually, when you talk about the pre-colored version, you're actually expanding it out to a, a vertex that doesn't have, a graph that doesn't have any pre-coloring at all. But uh, you want the pre-coloring for the induction ordering for the partial order that you use for your induction. Okay, that, that's sort of a long tangent, but hopefully helpful. Uh, okay, so now, finally, why do we use the potential? Why is potential better than max average degree? And again, uh, this is because of the gap lemma. So thus far, I've said almost nothing about the gap lemma. Um, so the way that you prove the gap lemma um, is like, the way that you prove the gap lemma in the Kostochka Yancey paper, and the way that we proved the gap lemma last time, uh, except that it's harder. Um, so there's sort of uh, there's sort of two things. There's sort of a, a weak gap lemma that just gets you a little constant bounded gap, and then there's this strong gap lemma, uh, which gets you a gap that grows linearly in K. Um, and this turns out to be really useful. Um, and this was. Um, a place where it was really helpful to have Matt Yancey as a co-author because, <laughs> uh, because he was the one that sort of uh, really got our gap lemma in a place where it allowed us to prove sharp results. So um, again, I talked about this last time, the gap lemma allows you to mess with the induced subgraph before you color it. You can sort of muck with it a little bit so that you don't change the potential by too much. And because you have this uh, lower bound on the potential, if you drop the potential by, say, this much, it's still OK, because you just need to keep your potential strictly above negative 3. And as long as it's above negative 3, for every induced subgraph, you don't have any critical subgraph, and so you're fine. Um, and this gives us, uh, oh, this gives us a lot, of, uh, a lot of power for our reducible configurations, uh, which I didn't say anything about. Um, and then finally, how do we finish the proof? Uh, it's just discharging, just like we finish all uh, potential method proofs. So uh, this is a sort of everything is overlaid on a discharging paradigm. What you're trying to do is you're trying to say, so you start out, we assume a minimal counterexample. And then for a minimal counterexample, we prove that certain things can't show up. And then we say, if none of those things show up, then you can do discharging and get a contradiction. Uh, okay, so let me uh, let me summarize. So we looked at IFK coloring, which partitions the vertex set into an independent set, and FK, which induces a forest. And this is kind of like we did last time, but um, each tree now has bounded order. So the order is at most K. Uh, so here's an example. This was sort of one of the first things we saw. This is an IF6 coloring. So you've got trees of order two and a tree down here of order six. And then the white vertices give you an independent set. And what we gave was sufficient conditions for an IFK coloring in terms of max average degree. Um, and those are sharp infinitely often for every K. And what we actually proved was something stronger in terms of critical graphs and potential, but that gives us the, the result for max average degree. Um, we also commented that uh, these are still sharp. If you go through the argument for those uh, constructed graphs not having an IFK coloring, 
it doesn't actually need the fact that we're requiring FK to induce an acyclic subgraph. Um, so there's this question of Henry Norton and Wood uh, that sort of motivated this, but I also think it's a very natural problem just to look at as partitioning into an independent set and some bounded order forest. Uh, it improved on a bunch of previous results. And the reason that we were able to get sharp results and, and sort of improve on all these is because of the gap lemma. That's what gives us a lot of power for the reducible configurations. Um, and that was, right, the potential method is what gives us the gap lemma. Uh, the pre-coloring is, it sort of seems like a complicated way to phrase things at first, but what it allows you to do is to specify the colors at lots of things using these gadgets that otherwise, if you didn't phrase it in terms of pre-coloring, uh, the gadgets would increase the order. But if you just say, oh, that doesn't, the gadgets don't count towards the order, then, uh, then that's fine. Um, and then uh, the coefficients in the row function, they come from the gadgets. Oh, so I maybe didn't say that on the previous slide. What you do, where the coefficients come from, uh, is you compute the coefficient, the potential of the whole subgraph that you added hanging off at that vertex. Um, and that is the potential that you give to that pre-colored vertex. So it's a bit tedious, but it's very straightforward. Um, and then we finish with discharging. So uh, again, I wouldn't necessarily recommend that you read all the details in this paper, but uh, also in this paper, I worked really hard in the introduction to try to explain how all the pieces come together and sort of what you should be thinking about. Um, so let me stop there. Thanks. Hey, let's thank Dan. Great timing. This 50 minute talk, you managed to fill the entire class. It's a professional at work. Uh, questions, questions? So I think Bernard told you in the chat at the start that I was going to force you to ask questions. So, um, so you should be ready now. Uh, last time, last uh, on Tuesday, it was a surprise, but, but now you saw it coming. So, um, um I'm a little confused about, uh, pre-coloring and I guess just how that's different than like coloring the graph, is it? Right, so uh, let's, right. So the idea is that, so say that I have some vertex here and I want to color the vertex, uh, I want to color the vertex U one, which means that the vertex uh, isn't, I'm not specifying the coloring, but I say, if it's if you decide to color it F, it's not going to contribute just one to the order of its F component, it's going to contribute two, because it already has an F neighbor, some other neighbor that's sort of not really drawn, but it's sitting there sort of lurking, waiting in the wings, that's colored F. And so if you color this vertex F, it's going to count two against the order of your F component rather than one. That's what it would mean to say that I'm coloring this, pre-coloring the vertex U1, right? So it says it's uncolored, U is for uncolored, but uh, the one is saying, if you color it F, you, you contribute the one for itself to the F component and that subscript one, you're gonna contribute another one, okay? So, the point of that, what I, the reason that that's useful is um, if you think about, um, if you think about the, it's, it's sort of uh, analogous to the gap lemma. Um, and in the previous slides, what I showed you was if you could put that edge in when you pre-colored. Um, so I said, uh, last time we were talking about if you had the triangle with two degree three vertices. And you ripped out the three vertices, but you put an edge between their neighbors that were off, off the triangle, then that sort of helped. And it made it easier to extend the coloring when you put that stuff back in, right? Mm -hmm. um, so 
the um, so adding these uh, so this pre-coloring is going to be useful for that because it's sort of um, what you're going to want to do is say you rip some stuff out um, and then when you and then you get uh, some neighbors of the stuff you ripped out is colored F, right? And so if you didn't know anything about the, the rest of the coloring out in the world, then what that would mean is anybody who has a neighbor colored F, you have to color it I, right? Because it might be that the component of that, uh, the F component containing that neighbor is already order K, right? And so now you can't add another vertex colored F to that component or it would break things. So what you wanna do, so actually, let me see if I can draw something real quick. Um, so let's just say this is the part that you're ripping out and this guy has a neighbor um, and he's colored F. So you rip this out and then you color the rest of the graph and he's colored F. Now, if this guy, is in a component that's uh, of order K, then when you come back, this guy is gonna have to be colored uh, I, mm -hmm. right? But here's, let's, let's do this instead. Um, so instead, let me, oh, we'll just do eraser. So instead, what I'm gonna do is I'm going to, before I pre-color the thing out in the world, before I color the thing out in the world, I'm gonna make this, oops, let's try it again. I'm gonna make this U1, okay? So what that's gonna say is, <clears throat> that's gonna say that vertex, when you color it out in the rest of the world, you could color it uh, I if you like, you also could color it F if you like. But if you color it F, then it's like there's this fake neighbor so I don't know how to draw it. I'll draw it as a square or something. Um, that's also colored F. And he's contributing to the order of this F component. And the reason that that's useful is now when you go back to extend the rest of the coloring, this guy isn't really here, but it tells us that we can color this guy F if we want to, right? Because now this guy will be colored F and you, you're worried about, am I gonna overrun the, the order, the allowed order of that F component? And the answer is no, because this fake neighbor sort of saved a place for me to be colored F, okay. right? Yeah. Um, and so what that pre-coloring does is it allows you to sort of put constraints on the coloring for the rest of the world so that when you go to extend it to your little bit inside, uh, there's there's still sort of more room for you. There's more space for you to find colors. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, sure. Uh, other questions? Um, so you may have said this, what, what was the reasoning behind choosing the second gadget in that? Uh, in that this one, uh, sorry. Uh, this gadget here? Yeah. Uh, well, so the, the important thing is you need to find the gadgets that are going to be most efficient in terms of row. So uh, it's not obvious a priori, but it turns out that it is true that uh, most of the time, uh, if you just want to increase uh, the subscript from U0 to U1 or U1 to U2, the best thing you can do, you could try out lots of things and nothing will be more efficient in terms of row uh, than just doing adding this triangle, okay? But somehow, um, if you're gonna add a whole bunch of triangles, you know, one after another, and you're gonna force this guy into F, it turns out that doing this all at one fell swoop is somehow more efficient. And so when you compute, so you could do it. So let me go back uh, one slide. So this, that gadget explains why you drop from eight to five, and then you don't drop from five to two, you drop from five to three. The reason you drop from five to three instead of five to two is because of this gadget. 
So if you were to implement it by just adding another one of these things, it would drop down all the way to two. But you can implement it using this instead. And sort of essentially, the average degree it, that you sort of add here is a little bit less than the average degree that you add here is sort of a way to think about it. So if you compute the potential that you get for this vertex and you compute the potential that you get for this vertex, here it ends up as three and here it ends up as two, right? So um, yeah, I'll just leave it at that. Um, a quick way to think about it is um, here, if you add two vertices and three edges, that drops things by three, right? Because you added uh, two times 15 and then you subtracted three times 11. So you added a negative three overall. And that's explaining why uh, in all of these places you're dropping from 15 to 12 to nine to six. That's just adding a triangle every time. And so it goes down by three. Um, it turns out that when you, when you go this way instead using that more complicated gadget, you can do things slightly more efficiently and you get away with a potential of three rather than two. That's a great question. I have a follow-up question on this. So why does it help to have the potential higher? Why does it help to have the potential you higher? If you have that just three instead of the two. Right. So I guess a good way to think about it is um, in general, high potential means that you have lots of uh, lots of slack and lots of flexibility because um, so one way to th think about it is we're trying to stay away from uh, potential at most negative three because those could be critical graphs, mm -hmm. right? Um, and what we want to do is we want to be able to change things a little bit. We want to be able to like muck with our subgraphs before we color them. Um, and changing things uh, drops our potential, right? And so having higher potential means that you have more room to change things before you get into trouble when you get down to negative three. I see. So you say that maybe it could be possible to do it without this trick, but it uh, gives you a little bit easier life. Yeah, there, there's but sort of no, too, but, uh, there's no re uh, reason. Um, well, I guess another way to think about it would be Right, so, so let me say this. If you, um, if you had any of these coefficients were too high, um, then the thing would be false because what would happen is you could, you could build counter, uh, you could build these sharpness examples where you were sort of getting more credit for having potential um, than you actually had. And so these things would be claiming to have potential higher than negative three, but they wouldn't really. And so they, you could really have uh, counter examples to your theorem. Um, you want to have it, the, this, all these coefficients as large as you possibly can, because it gives you more room to play with things before you run into trouble and you get down below this negative three threshold. Um, who's a, who else has questions? I had one. So yeah. I would assume that maybe a, a natural generalization would be to try something like an FLFK coloring. Absolutely. Do you see this method still working or or how much of this do you get from what you've done now or how much of this is, is just starting from scratch? That's a great question. Um, it's certainly something that I've tried. I spent a while thinking about it. And so um, to put it in context, um, the results um, of Borden, Kostochka, Yancey that I mentioned uh, way early on um, was it was an F2, F2 coloring, right? Um, so we said in each color class, you forbid a path on three vertices. So you will allow the color classes to induce edges. Um, so uh, I don't know how to do um, an F2, F3. So I like worked really hard to think about an F2, F3 or an F3, F3. And 
essentially the problem is that I, I don't know how to prove the gap lemma that I want. So um, I haven't really talked about how you prove the gap lemma, um, but uh, the way that you prove the gap lemma is, um, is basically just the picture is the same. Um, uh, and if you just sort of squint at this, this looks exactly like the proof that I gave you of the weak gap lemma on uh, the previous lecture, right? It's, it's a very similar thing, um, but somehow um, when we try to do it for two forests, uh, there's just a lot of flexibility in the coloring. And I don't know what you need is, you need that your subgraphs of this thing that you can track down to, you want them to have high, ideally you want them to have high potential, right? Um, the potential, the minimum potential over all the non-empty subgraphs of this thing, um, that ends up being the limiting factor in how big of a gap you can get. Um, and I could make it work for IFK, but well, even trying F2, F3, uh, I wasn't able to make it work. So the potential method is one of these things that when you see it, uh, like so many things, it's sort of when it works, it just looks like, oh yeah, that's not hard. Um, but there's lots of things that you try that don't work. Uh, and I've tried a lot of things for even for F2, F3 um, that, that don't work. And so right now, my plan is not to work on that further because I don't know how to do it. Hey, biology is better, right? You try experiment and it doesn't work and you write the paper. Exactly. You, you try it, it doesn't work. Main has a question. Yeah. Uh, what about something like I1, I2, FK? Uh, yeah, that's, a, that's another interesting uh, one. I... I have thought some about that. Uh, I think that there's uh, some possibility of extending this. Um, it's maybe something that I would like to get back to, but uh, we have, uh, you have only so much time in the world. And right now, most of that time is going to teaching online. Um, I hope that at some point that will not be the case, but, uh, but yeah, um, that is a natural one. And I think that there is a better chance of making that work. Um, but I haven't done it yet. So one thing that I'll just mention briefly is uh, it's sort of an interesting, uh, interesting transition here, the threshold that we're getting. So if you go back, well, let's see, let me go back to, uh, oh, I didn't, didn't say it here. So we'll go back to here. Um, this threshold that we're getting for every K, the threshold is below three, right? And that's kind of interesting. I think that there's an interesting contrast between that and what we talked about um, on Tuesday, which was if in that case, if you want IF coloring and you don't care about how big the, uh, the components are getting, well, there's a certain finite subset of things you have to forbid, but after you forbid those, you can get up to allowing mat of 3.2, right? We said it was 16 fifths, which is 3.2. So it's, it's sort of an interesting jump that um, if you bound the order of the components, you can never get above three. But if you allow the order to grow unbounded and you forbid some finite set of things, then you can go all the way up to 3.2. And that was kind of surprising. I guess it really just has to do with this so, sort of uh, the order of the four alls and there exists. Um, but uh, I th thought it was sort of an interesting uh, dichotomy. Any more uh, Looks like nobody is brave enough to ask further. Okay. Well, let's, thanks. Let's, this was fun. Uh, it's nice to nice to meet you guys. Hopefully, catch up at some point and have a beer. Um, uh, see you in person at a at a real conference. But uh, for now, uh, thanks, and uh, see you around virtually, perhaps. Yeah. Thank you.
Good talks.